everyone. Uh, this is going to be a kind of somewhat quick thrown together video, mainly because, well, a um, bunch of stuff came up and I was not able to get my regularly scheduled video done in time. Um, my apologies for that. So instead, I am going to be doing a video version of a book that I reviewed on the blog recently. Specifically, I am going to be doing a review of here the jrpg book this is much as with the crpg book that i reviewed a while back another epic tome in many in many senses of the term by bitmap books um as with the crpg book this has the full quality that you expect with something from bitmap in terms of the actual i can you know i'm just gonna keep holding this for a bit actual physical Going to the book hardcover, it's got a ribbon bookmark, which is wonderful. Nice stitching on the binding. This is something that's going to hold together well. This is, and like it's not perfect, in like it does have its minor issues. Like, so I've had this, I had this basically on a coffee table set, set up with other stuff set on top of it, and cases are getting slid around. And you'll see, like, there's a little bit of smudging going on around the corner there. Like, it, it gives it character, but, like, this could theoretically also happen with shelfware as well. So, something to keep in mind um, with your, um, with the book in terms of how you store it. Again, doing this vlog style. So, I, I'll be taking an occasional drink of water while, while you're in the video. So... Organizationally, um, the book is, rather than being strictly chronological, is organized by genre or publisher or developer and then chronologically. Or KZ franchise, like you'll have the Final Fantasy games together in an order, chronological order, Dragon Quest games together in chronological order, Atlas, Shin Megami Tensei titles, that sort of thing, but also going into genres and some mediums, like for example, classic PC um, JR, uh, Japanese role-playing games uh, from back in the day, or dungeon crawlers, or some of the limited massively multiplayer online games, or action RPGs, or that sort of thing. And it is a very comprehensive book. It is definitely not a case of absolutely everything is covered here, but it does a really good job of covering all the big stuff while giving plenty of room for little t for smaller titles. Uh, each section is given a nice piece of like pixel art. So for example, on um, the other franchises page, let me pull this up. Let's catch the camera. We have this art here sort of representing the mother franchise. Uh, but it's not from the mother franchise. It's original art. Um, some of this will get into stuff where it's like from other franchises completely, or like, for example, let's see if we can find the, like we have this one for the Mega 10 and Persona games. This is not art from any of those games in those franchises because the ones that are pixel art tend to be uh, first person perspective. And the ones that aren't tend to be polygonal. So, like, great original pixel art there. Um, very compre again, very comprehensive in terms of stuff it's covering. Not just the bit, not just the big names. Like, for monster collecting RPGs, like it's got poke it, or roguelikes. It's got yours, um, mystery dungeon series naturally, but it's also got like, um. Azure Dreams for the PlayStation and Baroque for um, PS1 and PS2 and Saturn and that sort of thing. For action games, yeah, it's got your... Uh, it's got your Tales series um, and your Mana series, sure. but it, And of course, of course, it has the Quintet classic series. But it's also got Govelius from Compile. It's got the Guardian Legend, which we've talked about on Nintendo Power Retrospectives. Because um, since that one did get a U.S. release, while though sadly, um, 
I don't remember if Govellius did or not. Because Govellius was MSX. And it did get a Master System release. We didn't get a lot of Master System JRPGs. Um, that sort of thing. So, from a critical analysis perspective, it's interesting. I picked up this book actually well before the kind of controversy or discourse, or however you wish to call it, came about with uh, Final Fantasy 16 with Yoshi P talking about how Japanese developers have reacted to the term JRPG and viewing it as a degree of ghettoization and stigmatization. And I've been spending a fair amount of time thinking about this because like on the one hand, yeah, um, the Soulsborne games, definitely Japanese role-playing ga are definitely role-playing games from Japan. Um, but like we, when we talk about JRPGs, oftentimes we are talking about games from judgment in terms of quality aside, which unfortunately in the late nineties, early aughts, um, in the PS2 era, into the PlayStation 3 era, we had the sense of stigmatization for of Japanese role-playing games in terms of um, lumping them all together as being bad, which is a unfair, unreasonable um, comparison, and also to a degree kind of racist. I I was not one of the people who was of of that perspective from them all being bad. I sought out Japanese role-playing games whenever I could find them because from my perspective, not just because I'm a person who enjoys anime, like, like here I am sitting here with a Golden Sun t-shirt on. It's like, I, JRP, Japanese role-playing games are my jam. Uh, Japanese role-playing games tend to, like, role-playing games from Japan more often than not tended to have a much stronger narrative focus to them than American and Western role-playing games uh, in terms of characterization, in terms of the depth of the narrative and that sort of thing. To put it in perspective, like, on the one hand, I do enjoy the Elder Scrolls games a lot as a big sandbox you can roam around and play in and do all sorts of side quests and that sort of thing. Um, but if you were to ask me about the personalities of any of the quest givers for the Fighters Guild quests in Morrowind, which is considered one of the highlights of the series, I'd go, um, uh, well, I, uh, um, I like the quest givers in Western role playing games tend to be bland. Your character tends to be bland. Um, like the great innovation of Bioware, and to a degree before that, Black Isle, was the whole mindset with those games and your selections, particularly when you get into like Dragon Age 1 and 2 and 3, of giving your character a personality based on your dialogue points. This is something that um, Obsidian would carry on through stuff like the Players of Eternity games, of letting you give your character a personality by selecting your dialogue options, as opposed to, like, so many... Like, even, like, with Fallout, I'm like, your character... Like, you ask questions about what the... Um, what your dialogue choices are or the what for it's like dialogue options to ask questions about what various elements of the plot and the world and the character you're talking to and that sort of thing but on the other hand i'm like any personality that my character in um fallout which again is a was a black isle game 
or my character in the Elder Scrolls or any of my characters in the Wizardry series or Might and Magic or Ultima or anything like that. Any personality that they have is purely in my head sitting at the, at the, at the, my computer, at my console, at whatever. And it makes for a situation for, as a player, my perspective in terms of the plot is, the personality is, it stops being me playing a role, unless it is a game which gives specific options to help you, to, to cause you to define a role in a acting standpoint, as opposed to a combat DPS um, tank healer controller standpoint. Um, it ultimately ends up just being, I'm just kind of playing me because there's no other personality within my character to do that. The, like the conceit of, again, the Bioware role-playing games where you're defining your per character's personality through dialogue choices for all the faults of um, Paragon versus Renegade as light side, dark side, or that sort of thing is at least it gives your character a degree of personality, even if it's Boy Scout versus Butthole. As I could have done asshole there, but Butthole alliterates more with Boy Scout. But in any case, I digress. Um, and like the logical extension of this in terms of defi of your character personality, both through dialogue choices, or say your dialogue choices defining your character and giving them a personality and letting you play a role is, well, Disco Elysium, um, but even then you're starting out with a blank slate and building from there, but it's, so it's picking the dialogue, the dialogue options to define a character that you as a player feel comfortable with. Whereas from the other hand, because with role-playing games from Japan, you, they tend normally to have the characters be somewhat predefined even if some of them, like, for example, the Dragon Quest series, your main protagonist, is something of a blank slate, there is a sense to them of, okay, these characters have a personality that is determined by the story, and the characters will interact with each other through that person, through their personalities bouncing off of each other and leading to interesting opportunities for written interactions. Which is where the other things can kind of fall apart because for Western role with role playing games from the West is with the exception of, of rigidly predefined characters like, say, Geralt of Rivia and the Witcher series, you your game can't necessarily do the interactions to provide all of the personality to reflect all of the personality variations that your character can give. There are plenty of exceptions for this. Um, we get some of that with I mean, Disco Elysium is a good is a good exception for this, but like even with Bioware's games, your inner party banter in Dragon Age Two, uh, Inquisition, and that sort of thing, isn't like your play your character does not necessarily chime into the banter like you. Divinity Original Sin does this, but it's also again, it's an exception. Like you're warming around in, like, because Bioware is like the the highlight, not the highlight, but their one of their signature traits is your party banter, and so you'll be rolling around in the Mass Effect games or Dragon Age or what have, or with um, uh, even before that with Baldur's Gate, and your party members will chat with each other, but they won't chat with you. They won't chat with your playable character because depend because depending on interactions, you like they may like you may want to do dialogue choice to determine how you do that, at which point they'll instead that what they'll do is they'll have uh, the speech bubble pop up for them somewhere on there to see that they're ready to do dialogue. But it's not but that's it's partitions it down into a much more rigorous or a much more specific thing um, for that character. It doesn't have the sense of 
It doesn't give any necessary sense of dynamism to it that you get for the walking around dialogue. By contrast, to give you an example from, again, from the Tales series, you have, when you are wandering around with your characters, um, the option for a dialogue sequence will pop up and you can select it and you'll have the care and you'll have a vignette with the characters talking to each other and it'll be and it will be every member in your party like even like every character you've picked up and you can have being an active member of your party or not necessarily will be a part of this it will be um even in some degree or another even if they're not um some characters aren't forefronted aren't centered in this dialogue scene you will have um some of the characters in the background, if not in a acting sense in terms of uh, positioning, but like they'll toss a bit in there to show them reacting or that sort of thing. And that's something that Western style games aren't necessary, haven't have not necessarily gotten good at yet. That said, on the other hand, like the book does get into this book does get into basically Western attempts to kind of imitate the genre. Um, with varying degrees of success. Some of them, like Secret of Evermore for the Super Nintendo, is one that was developed on, um, yes, by Square, in by Square, but by Square U USA, and uh, strictly using U.S. development teams, or stuff like Cosmic Star Heroin, or CrossCode, or, yes, uh, the um, your Undertale... Uh, for basically a west a western take on this structure i'm not going to say genre but because calling jrpg a genre is again like calling anime a genre there's it contains multitudes so is using jrpg in my opinion a bad term not like, a little bit yes because when with the rise of stuff like Undertale, with the rise of stuff like Crosscode, with this rise of stuff like Chained Echoes, we are seeing more and more successful games in this style coming out, uh, like not just coming out of Japan, but also coming from elsewhere. But. eliminate the J from it necessarily. I think as, as there is a definite sense of what need to have a much bigger conversation about this in terms of addressing the medium um, or a, and where, how these fit within the medium of video games because on the one hand like the, putting the J in JRPG is not completely accurate um, also like some games in this style also didn't just come from Japan we had a, a few years where you had some games in this style coming from Korea and um, some of them even made it to the US uh, did not necessarily do well but they came out here I'm almost tempted the thought that comes to my mind is back, way back in the day, before Knights of the Old Republic and Morrowind came to consoles, there was the, the breakdown between the two was frequently console RPG versus computer RPG. However, we've hit an era where computer RPGs are coming to consoles. Um, Mass Effect was meant to come out on both from the very beginning. Morrowind um, got launched on both console and PC. And because of this, also you're seeing console developers in Japan when they're making role-playing games, taking cues from Western, uh, from this type of Western role-playing game. Um, whether it's Breath of the Wild, having a big expansive open world inspired by the Elder Scrolls games, uh, whether it is... Actually, even similar sense, also, um, the Dragon's Dogma. Um, or I'm not going to say the Dragon's Dogma series, because it's effectively, at the moment, just kind of one-ish games 
one game, like one single player game, and then an MMO, uh, taking similar cues. But on the other hand, and the, the other hand, lots of the type of games that we're seeing talked about in here, like they started on PCs in Japan, moved to consoles, and are coming back to PCs now, particularly in the United States. I am playing Trails in the Sky, uh, second chapter at the moment. That is a game which launched on mobile, on handhelds originally, and but took off when it got a PC release in the United States, um, particularly in the United States, but also in Japan, and has gotten legs on both side, on both handhelds and both portable and consoles and PCs across the board. And certainly the Final Fantasy games going forward have been getting like released on pretty much absolutely everything as the barriers for developing for both PCs and consoles at the same time, or porting to both, have gotten simpler. So, using falling back on the old standby of console versus uh, computer doesn't work either. So I think, as a possible turn, keeping the same C and C approach here, either C and C or C and N, I think C and D would be like, perhaps a better term would be the N RPG, the narrative. RPG, the art role-playing game that puts a heavy focus, not necessarily a big sandbox for you to explore, with, yes, quests involved in there and that sort of side of things, but one with, with a particular focus on developing on narrative in terms of inner dynamics between characters, narrative in terms of developing a character, or narrative in the sense of a primary, somewhat perhaps somewhat linear with a little side-branching pack Path's narrative thrust to the story and how the characters react to that versus and that's where things get tricky for me is, is finding the right prefix for the for other genre the other possibility that comes to mind is there is a variety of chart which if you've played this type of rpg before and also some also some sports games you might have seen before the spider chart or web chart where you have instead of your standard um uh y and z axes you have a uh, kind of web and you have points in different axes and on the different branches of the web and you get kind of this big blob that reflects how the like how the character exists on certain attributes or what have you. And that might be the way to handle this by putting together a bunch of axes in terms of narrative focus, um, character definition, not um, with um, the type of mechanics or that sort of thing. I will probably have to put together and like, this is the kind of thing where for this part, for how to break this down would probably fit better in a blog post because this would level this would flow better in writing than presented in this way um maybe maybe if i whipped up some visual aids and turned it into basically a not quite powerpoint presentation panel but something so. but this plus the crpg book go together excellently. Um, if you are a fan of playing role-playing games on computers and consoles, these two books together are a wonderful addition to your collection and quite possibly will give you a whole bunch of new books or new games that make you want to go seek out. Whether it's going to GOG or Steam to see if you can find a copy of Septera Core, or that will run on modern computers or going or hunting down fan patches for some classic uh, PC role playing game from Japan or what have you this this will definitely expand your want to play list and uh, there will be a link to where you can get it it will not be an affiliate link but there will be a link in the doobly doo um, to where you can get it from bitmap bit, bitmap books directly Oh, 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 oh,
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.